So what we've got in this section of Scripture, four little stories kind of gathered together. Not real clear how they're even related to each other other than they all happen around Ephesus. So be thinking about that because i got a theory for why Luke has picked these stories up. There must have been many other things that happened. It's clear there was a lot of other things that happened, but he just selected these stories. And, of course, Paul was working with Luke in the writing of this book. So something is, it must be significant here. The first one is the story about a guy named Apollos. At the end of 18 there, 24, it says, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, that's in, e in uh, Egypt, in Africa, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. Some of your translations read that he was mighty in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, although he knew only the baptism of John. He must have lost touch with the situation during Jesus' life or maybe just before his life, you know, John taught about the coming of the Christ. Apparently, he doesn't understand the cross. He doesn't understand what Jesus ended up doing. And so he began speaking boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So from this story... You know, for one thing, I think that is a, a noble example that they set. They didn't uh, confront him and try to embarrass him by, you know, uh, actually the real facts are these, you know, in front of the group. He, they waited until afterwards, and that's something to think about if you ever notice a, like a teacher in your home church says something bogus or not quite right. You know, do you really have to correct it there and then? Is it that serious, or could you do what like they do and take him aside afterwards and say, I wonder if you shouldn't have put this in different words or did you consider whatever and it makes it a lot easier you know to be corrected we should correct our teachers you know it says that uh, the prophet should let a prophet speak and the rest should pass judgment meaning that the whole fellowship should be calling into question things that teachers say and if we feel that they're out of their you know not in, in line with what the scripture teaches we should bring it to people's attention but we can do it like this anyway this this apollos guy becomes a major player. When you read that he was deeply versed, mighty in the scriptures, and that he was an eloquent man and spoke well, these are very unusual features in that culture where very few were, were a learned uh, people. And not like in our culture where you have a lot of people with a lot of learning. That's, that was not the case back then. And so having a guy like this around was really unusual. And we read that he then wanted to go to Achaia and to the brothers encouraged him. That's over where Corinth is. And, his, and he went there, we know, because if you read 1 Corinthians 1, uh, they were responding in a very carnal way where some were saying, I'm of Paul, and some were saying, I am of Apollos, right? I am of Peter. And they were, they were splitting into factions based on who their favorite preacher was, which is really stupid. There's, there's only one body of Christ. We don't fragment over things like that. We don't follow men anyway. We follow God. So on arriving, though, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted the Jews in public debate, proving from the Scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. And so there's that notion again uh, that you can prove uh, that Jesus is the promised Messiah by studying the, the scriptures, which in, the, which in this time context refers entirely to the Old Testament. It's the Old Testament that he's referring to here. And Apollos did that. So he became one of the real big bats in the early church. There's your first story. Second story, the 12 men. 19.1, it comes about while Apollos was over at Corinth, Paul having passed down through this. So he's on this third journey. Here he comes down toward Ephesus. As he's coming in, we skipped this part last week, he found some disciples. Hmm. He says to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, no. We, we haven't even heard whether there is 
such a thing as the Holy Spirit. And you heard that expression before. He says, well then, into what were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. They're, they're disciples. They're disciples not of Jesus. They're disciples of John the Baptist. It's just, this, by the way, perfectly accords with extra-biblical material that we have. For instance, in Josephus is one source that says that John the Baptist's fame spread clear across the diaspora of the Jews, which were all of these communities spread across, across the Roman Empire. All of them admired John, and so he had terrific influence. These guys are followers of John the Baptist. So similar, you know, Apollos was a follower of John the Baptist. But he apparently knew about Jesus. He had stayed long enough for Jesus to make the scene and then must have left. These guys probably even left earlier. And so Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in him who was coming after him. And they're like, yeah, that's right. The guy who he's not worthy to lace his shoes. He's like, yeah, that turns out to be Jesus. And so all of this, is, and he gives them the rest of the story. And so when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so they became Christians at that point. When Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying, just like those guys in, in the beginning of Acts. And so this clearly signified that now they had the Holy Spirit with the gifts. They were all in all about 12 men. There's your second story. This story, by the way, has become uh, very controversial and has become a key proof text used by the so-called Pentecostal movement to show that here, you know, this is one of these cases where it happened like it often does today, where people might come to believe and become disciples of God, followers of Jesus on some level, but then they don't quite understand the fullness of the Holy Spirit and so maybe at some later time, maybe months, maybe years later, in these guy, guys' case, they had been followers of John decades, probably two decades before, and he's been dead now. And then they receive the fullness, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which includes the tongues speaking and so forth. And so that this is a pattern that we should also follow today. And so if you're just like a basic Christian, but you haven't had this second blessing, this, this uh, baptism with the Holy Spirit, then you need to go and try to get that by having people pray. You pray for it, you tarry before the Lord and wait for this thing to come on, and then you speak in tongues, and then you have like twice as much power as you ever had before for ministry and for living the Christian life and all that kind of stuff. I think they're misreading this passage, actually. If you, if you look carefully at, at what is actually stated, they, the Pentecostals say this passage shows that people often become Christians at one time, but then receive the second work of grace later. To become a Christian, that's when you invite Jesus to come into your life. So let's be clear on our definition. What do we think becoming a Christian even is? It's not joining a church. It has nothing to do with any kind of outward institution. People say, oh, I've been a Christian ever since I was baptized. That has nothing to do with it. Baptism is something that should happen after you become a Christian, as a statement that you have believed. It's what Jesus refers to in this passage, that he knocks at the door, and if anyone opens the door, I'll come into him, he says. And so it's inviting Christ into your life. It's forming a personal relationship directly with Jesus. Now, in this story, these guys had never done that. They were not Christians. They were disciples of John the Baptist, which meant they were believers in God, but in a more like an Old Testament sense. You know, guys in the Old Testament, you think of the great you know, believers there, Moses, David, the prophets and stuff. They're believers. But they're not Christians because they, you know, they don't even know that part yet. And that's where these guys were at. So it's not a picture of Christian people becoming Christians and later getting the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It didn't happen. The Pentecostal take on this passage is that it shows that people can receive the Holy Spirit at one time because Pentecostals believe that everyone receives the Holy Spirit when you, when you believe in Christ. 
but not the fullness, not the baptism of the Spirit. That's later, when you get the second blessing. In fact, though, these guys had never received the Spirit in any way, shape, or form. They made that clear right in the passage when they said, we never even heard about it, that there's such a thing as the Holy Spirit. Right? Didn't you receive the Holy Spirit? And they said, no, we did not. We didn't even know there was such a thing. So this is not a picture of what Pentecostal theology claims it is. It's quite different than that. This is a picture of people transitioning from the Old Testament covenant into the New Covenant and receiving the Holy Spirit in the process. Now, there was a, it does look like there might have been a slight delay of seconds or minutes between when they were baptized and when he, when he put his hands on them. It sounds like there could have been a delay uh, of minutes at the most there. But what we have to understand is that technically, until the Holy Spirit enters a person, that person is not a Christian believer. They're not. And, and we can base that directly on Romans chapter 8, verse 9. If anyone does not have the Spirit, he doesn't belong to God. This is definitional. You can't be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. These guys didn't have the Spirit. They weren't Christians. Now, why would God wait? Why didn't, why didn't he do them like Cornelius? who the minute he believed, the Spirit came. Remember that story in 10? Here it seems like that it doesn't go that way, but he waits until they get baptized, and then when they come out, he puts his hands on them, and then the Spirit comes. We don't know exactly why that delay is. The probable reason would be that here these guys are. They knew that John was a prophet. They know the Old Testament is Scripture. And now here's this guy, this Paul character, telling him all these other things and stuff. And of course, Paul is an apostle. He has divine authority to declare uh, the doctrine that he, had, he had, re had revealed to him. So God basically arranged that when his hands touched them, <laughs> the Holy Spirit came in. And so, uh, you know, and, and that basically is a way of telling these guys, listen to him. He knows what he's talking about, Okay. And that would have been what they would have taken away. It's like, okay, fill us in on the rest of the story. So that was, that's probably the reason for the delay. The main, final point I want to make about this, though, has to do with hermeneutics, the science of interpreting a text. To interpret a text correctly, to not make a mistake, which is what I think has happened in Pentecostal theology, and I should, I should clarify, when I say Pentecostal, there's a group of denominations that follow that teaching. There's another group called Charismatic who are more moderate. They're not, they don't think you have to have a second work of grace, and, and I, that, that would not be a, an objectionable group. But I think this, this extreme Pentecostalism is pretty objectionable from my point of view because it sets up two kinds of Christians, you know, the haves and the have-nots. And so uh, the result is, is division. It's pretty hard to work with people when they think that all the, everything you do is done in the energy of the flesh. You know, and it's like, how do you work with that? And so as a result, in one church after another where people got involved in this theology, the church ends up splitting up. And that's not a, a good fruit that's being born there. But anyway, in interpreting a text, one of the reasons they went astray here is that they're going into a passage which is a story, a narrative, and really an unusual narrative. There isn't a lot of explanation about what was going on, and they're basing a real heavy major doctrine on a story. Now, if what they're saying was true, we should be able to go to other passages and confirm that that's true through their teaching, and we can't. Only a couple of stories are used to base a doctrine on, and they're not that clear. One rule in hermeneutics says never base a major doctrine on an unclear passage. That makes sense. All, everything important in the Bible is taught multiple times and very clearly. So stick with that. And secondly, that you can't base 
a doctrine on a story of what happened because, yeah, okay, that happened, but how do we know that that applies in all situations? We don't unless we have that backed up in one of the teaching sections of Scripture. So you, you shouldn't base it in both. The, both of those uh, rules were not followed here, and that's why you end up with a mistake. Story number three. Supernatural war. They tell a couple of uh, very uh, unusual, just short stories. This one, it says, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hand of Paul. This is in Ephesus now. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons were being carried from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and evil spirits went out. Whew, never seen anything like that. But also, it says, some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempting to name over those who had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Okay, so what we have here are exorcists who are exorcising evil spirits out of people for money. This is their livelihood. And they figure, well, looks like Paul's got... a uh, got the upper hand, you know, he's had a lot of success in exorcism, so we'll just uh, do like he does, and they come in, and we read about this, these seven sons of one Sceva, a uh, Jewish chief priest, were doing this, so here's these seven guys, they're, the, they're going to go and exorcise uh, a demon from a demon-possessed man, and they come in, we adjure you by Jesus who Paul preaches. And the evil spirit answered them and said, I recognize Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you? <laughs> and the man in whom was the evil spirit leapt upon them and subdued all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. <laughs> Gee. Whoa, that's hard to imagine. Well, I know they wore robes and stuff, so it's probably easier than depancing someone these days with our, you know, custom-fitting uh, clothes. But uh, I guess it goes to show that you really can't fake it when you're involved in spiritual warfare, right? These guys didn't know Christ. They weren't in there with him. And so when they tried to bust out with that like a... Like a uh, a magic, uh, you know, set of abracadabra, whatever. The spirit saw right through him. Says, you know, yeah, nice try, Jesus. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, you guys. And he blows them away. And uh, it, it's interesting that in and most accounts of demon possessed people, so extraordinary strength is one of the features. Like that guy in Mark six, he could break chains. They chained him, and he broke the chains and stuff. So it's dangerous to mess around in this field. And this became known to all, both the Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus, and fear fell upon them, and all uh, fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Many also of those who had believed kept coming, confessing, and disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of all. And they counted up the price of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. Well, I referred to this passage briefly last week just from the standpoint of how much an incredible sum of money that was to buy a, a huge pile. This was, this was a 20-foot you know, tall pile of books or something to cost that much money. And it shows there must have been hundreds, probably thousands of people in this group to have that many books. Now... To burn the books. This is all based on st strict biblical instruction from the Old Testament, also repeated in the New, to the effect that as Christians we are to sever all ties with occult religion. The occult are the collection of practices related to trying to access spiritual power through things like fortune-telling, you know, palm reading, laying cards, Ouija boards, seances, calling up the dead, radiesthesia, where you use a rod and pendulum like water witching, these, these 
practices very big throughout history, going back thousands of years, astrology, part of this as well. That's omen reading. Uh, contacting the dead. These were all forbidden to Christians. According to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10 and following, God says, I don't want to see any of that in any of you people and anyone that does this. The reason, of course, he says it's abominable to me for people to do this. And the reason God finds it abominable is because where do they get the power to tell somebody's future? Where do they get the power to heal or the power to put a hex on someone, call a spell down? These are spiritual forces that they're dealing with, probably, almost certainly, from the other side. Not God. Yeah, people will say, well, I, I only work for God. Well, God says don't do it. So why, how would you be working for him? People might even think that they're working for God. They think that. But the God that they're working for is a disguised evil spirit. And then uh, there is a recompense that comes in when people become, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, come under the influence of uh, spiritual beings because they're asking for favors. When you, when you go to a uh, psychic uh, or what have you, you're asking for a favor. And once that, if that is ever granted to you, then in, in spiritual terms, you owe that being that just gave you that reading something. And it's going to be influence. It'll be influence in your life is what you owe them. And so this is how people become uh, subjected to uh, spiritual uh, subjection. Or even at the most extreme uh, case, spiritual possession, where an evil spirit actually takes possession of a person and they lose their free will, uh, which can happen in extreme cases. Very dangerous. That's why they were burning these books. They, didn't, they wanted to completely sever that. And so what we have here is a picture of a prayer of renunciation. Okay? It's an example that I think we should still follow today. If you have a background in the occult, uh, first of all, it's important to get those materials, the books, the charms, the cards, uh, any, any you know, amulets, things like that and to destroy them. And really, it's best to do this with fellow believers so that in a public way, where, with others bearing witness to what's happening, you can say, any agreement that I may have made, whether it was explicit or, or not with my knowledge, I declare it, you know, I'm out of that, I'm it's se separated from it, and I'm putting all of that under the cross of Christ and taking my stand with Him. And then you destroy those, those objects so there isn't that point of identification with the occult world anymore. That's what they did. I've done this a few times, a number of times with people, because the occult's becoming very big in our culture again, through New Age spirituality and all kinds of fortune-telling and uh, uh, work that people do in that area. It's becoming very common for uh, people to meet the Lord today and have this background in the occult. And it can cause problems for you. Separate yourself from the occult with some friends, Christian friends. Pray a prayer of renunciation. Get rid of the crap. Do like they did here. And so the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. So in this story, this is really a story about spiritual warfare. What we see happening here is a collision between the power of God and the power of the evil one. And so it's not that they're just persuading people, you know, or that it's not a sociolog sociological phenomenon, but it's a spiritual phenomenon where the forces of evil are being driven back by the power of God. Spiritual warfare is taught in the Bible. That's what we're engaged in. You know, if Satan isn't real, then what is our explanation for what's going on on earth? I, the entire biblical picture collapses. Uh, if, if Satan is not real, there has to be a being that accounts for the evil and, uh, and is fomenting evil in this world, or else what are we saying then that God is the source both of good and of evil? That's where you're left. Unless there is this concept 
uh, of a vast, you know, spiritual realm of evil spiritual beings. I believe it's real. I think, frankly, believing in God would make no sense if you didn't believe in this. I don't know, I don't know how you could even integrate what your worldview is. He exists. We know that he hates God. He hates God's followers. Jesus said in John 10 that I came so to give people life that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. But the, the thief that came only to rob and kill and destroy. He says in John 8, he was a murderer from the beginning and the, he's a liar and the father of lies. Very dangerous being, very deceptive. People often end up under the influence of Satan thinking the whole time that I came up with this or thinking that this is God that has shown me this when it's actually Satan, a liar and a deceiver. We know that he struggles for power, guarding his kingdom, which is the world system in which we live, from uh, incursion by God's people. So in Ephesus, what's happening is the people of God are pushing into Ephesus. And every foot that they progress, his kingdom has to recede by that same foot. That is the true nature of spiritual battle. I've heard people talk about spiritual warfare in real freaky ways like, uh, you know, uh, I remember one, one uh, couple were telling me that uh, she had a giant purple demon gnawing on her shoulder, you know, that this guy saw. And you're just like, oh, good Lord, get a grip. Why would the prince of the power of the air want to come and gnaw on some teenager's shoulder? That's not what they do. This whole thing to makes total sense, okay? What they're doing is they're going to try to block you and me from sharing the life-changing power of the gospel, the good news, with people that they're holding in darkness. They, wanna, they want to pull these people down. They hate them. They want to see them destroyed. And so when Christians push into the area, this is a threat, particularly if they're talking about what they've learned about Christ. And so this is when the battle begins. There's our third story, story number four, that riot at Ephesus. It starts in 23. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way, that's what the word they used for Christianity, the way of Jesus in the early church. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little amount of business for the craftsmen. These, were, these might have been spirit houses that are little replicas of Artemis' temple. You'll see these in many parts of the world today where people keep a spirit house on front of their house and uh, invoke a spirit to come and live in there. They think to protect their household. But again, that's not how God works. So whatever's in there is either nothing and they're wasting their money or they really do get a spirit to come in there, in which case that's a lot worse because it's going to be one of the other guys. Anyway, so this guy... He called all of his buddies together along with the workers in related trades and said, man, you know we receive a good income from this business. So he's very upfront about his motives. It's you know, dollars and cents. That's what, that's what this is about. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. Duh. A man-made God? Uh, yeah, I guess that is no God at all. We, so, so we can just create gods? No. God created us. That's the way that works. We can't create a God. It's ridiculous. Man-made God is, is no God at all. Like, yeah, I, I believe Paul probably taught that. He says, he goes on, he says, there's danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. Now that's pretty bad when uh, you're God and somebody steals your divine majesty. <laughs> I hate it when that happens, huh? 
how likely is it that uh, God could have somebody steal his divine majesty? Is that really what happened? Or would it be more likely that there was no such thing as his God in the first place? The whole thing's a human creation, which he just admitted. And in fact, it's really a scam, which is for money. And so, you know, this is all unraveling because... Here come the followers of Christ in, and they're telling people the truth. This is all BS and crap. And people are realizing, you know, I think it is crap. And so here, Demetrius getting worried. When they heard this, they were filled with rage, and they began crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! And so what's happening is they're whipping up the uh, enthusiasm, the juices, and the rage. This is turning into a lynch mob, a riot, where they're going to try to find these guys and kill them. The city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed with one accord to the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Apparently, they didn't find Paul. They just found these two. They drag him down to the theater. So there's, here's an amphitheater out there. We have thousands of people now pouring into this theater. They got these guys. This is a very dangerous situation. This could have been a bloodbath here. Paul is outside of the assembly. He wants to go in. He's like, I'm going to go in there. He probably wants to go in there and stand up and try to speak like he did at, uh, at the Areopagus, something like that. And the others are just like hanging on to him, pinning him down. They will not let him go in there, which is probably a real good thing. I don't <laughs> I think that would have been uh, uh, extreme. This was a very risky situation. These uh, kinds of, uh, this is mob violence which can turn, uh, you know, this is murderous rage these guys are feeling. Also, some of the Asiarchs who were friends of his sent to him and repeatedly urged him not to venture into the theater. These were city rulers, basically, uh, you know, high up, people, Asiarchs, they're um, in the uh, administration of the province of Asia, and they're sending him out, tell him, don't come in here, do not let him come in here. These guys will tear him apart. So then, some were shouting one thing, some another, the assembly was in confusion, and the majority didn't even know for what cause they had come together. It's just like, hey, something's happening, let's check it out. At that point, some of the crowd concluded it was Alexander, since the Jews had put him forward, and having motioned with his hand, Alexander was intending to make a defense to the, to the assembly. So he's going to stand up and try to give a speech. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, a single outcry arose from them, all as they shouted for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Well, so you see there's a strain of anti-Semitism in here. That, that really got the blood boiling there. And, of course, uh, they're not only anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism is nothing new. It's been there all, way back until ancient times. But also they knew that Jews only believed in one God, which directly contradicted their view that there are many gods. And, they, and they, that angered people. So here they are shouting. It's a chant. It, it, this would be like one of those Ayatollah things that you see in Iran, you know. Anyway, 35, after quieting the multitude, the town clerk gets up there. Men of Ephesus, what man is there, after all, who doesn't know that the city of Ephesus is a guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of the image which fell down from heaven? It's a meteor. They had a meteorite that in the temple there, which they believed... You know, they didn't know what meteors were. They'd see this thing, you know, a bright thing coming down out of the sky, complete mystery. And so they went and found one that hit, and they're like, this is from God. This is an image. And then you could even look and look. It even looks a little bit like a face on there, something like that. So they bring it up, set it up, and they, they were worshiping the image that fell from heaven. Totally superstitious. This is old bull. Since then, these are undeniable facts. Then you ought to keep calm and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of our goddess. 
So then, if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a complaint against any man, the courts are in session, the proconsuls are available, let them bring charges against one another. But if you want anything beyond this, it shall be settled in a lawful assembly. For indeed, we are in danger of being accused of a riot in connection with today's affair, since there is no real cause for it. And in this connection, we shall be unable to account for this disorderly gathering and I've explained before, the Romans did not allow riots. And if you, if you had a riot in your city, that was considered proof that you were a weak ruler, a weak, a weak leader, and you would be deposed and, and often punished. And then they would send in a, uh, a legion of uh, uh, Roman soldiers and occupy the city, and there was a lockdown, persecution. It was very bad. That's what he's talking about. We don't, want, we don't even want to be accused of a riot here. And after saying this, he dismissed the assembly, and the story ends right there. Just like that's it. So there's the story. Nothing happened. Okay. So there's our four stories. Now, I could see why Luke might inc uh, include this particular story. This would be good. If it's true, like they say, some people argue that the book of Acts is like a legal brief for Paul, that as he's about to stand trial in Rome, that these were, these were accounts for his lawyer to use in his defense. This would fit that description because this story showed that yes, there was a riot and disorder, but that it was completely out of line. And you know, if they looked at that in Rome, they'd be like, yeah, he didn't do anything. These were these other knuckleheads. So you could see why they would put something like that in there for that reason. But I don't think that's the main reason. Ask ourselves, why, okay, so here you're writing a book. You're the author of a book. You're trying to recount something. And you tell four little stories like this. They don't seem to have a lot of relation to each other. You know, it's like you've gathered these particular stories out of all the stories that happened there. And what's the threat? You know, why, why does he pick these? <clears throat> why tell these seemingly unrelated stories in sequence, all somehow related to Ephesus? Here's what I think. When you're hoping to foster a movement, or when you're analyzing why did a movement of God happen, the most important thing is that God has to act. You can't come and say, okay, how do you get a movement going? Okay, start with this technique, and then, to, and then when that's, go to that one there, and be sure you bring in this one and so forth, and so you have a, a series of steps to take. It doesn't work that way. The way it works is that a movement is a movement of the Spirit of God. And so when you, if you see one of these, uh, what you're seeing is God himself acting, and that's what... The, the true thread of these stories is. Apollos, this brilliant, super educated, eloquent man, a man who became super influential. How fortunate it was that Aquila and Priscilla just happened to uh, run into him in the city of Ephesus, hundreds of miles from Alexandria or Israel, either one. And so, boom, they run into him. They explain the way of Christ. He becomes one of the important leaders in the early church. That's not an accident, okay? Uh, you, you, yeah, you have to read between the lines here a little bit, but what's, what we're seeing is an act of God. He's the one that brought, he's like this guy. He's a believer, Old Testament style. He needs the rest of the story. I got a couple of key players, and I'm going to put these guys together. And that, God was the one that did that. Paul runs into these 12 men out in, in the countryside. It wasn't even in the city. How likely is that? 12 guys that are disciples. What, it, what was it? Some kind of a commune they're living in out there? And, uh, you know, but here's, here's the thing. Again, that's not an accident. These were God's guys. They were believers. And God's like, I got some guys right over here. They don't know. They, they have never even heard of the Holy Spirit. And so as Paul's coming down, working his way down to Ephesus, you're going to be going this way, Paul. And I'm going to have these guys out where they're going to run into you. And uh, boom, 
Next thing you know, these guys got the rest of the story and were brought into and it became part of, of what was happening there. We see occult power being overthrown in Ephesus. Who does that? I don't know how to do it. Do you? You know how to um, blow away an evil spirit? Hell, we can't even see them. We don't even know when they're there. So how do you, uh, how do you overcome their power? I have no idea. We don't overcome it. God has to overcome that. He's the only one that can, he can do that. That's, that's not even breaking a sweat for him. He's got infinitely more power than they do. So that's what we need. We need God to come into the field here and, and, uh, and uh, advance things and roll back the evil forces that are opposing. We see this murderous riot where it looks like, oh my God, they're gonna, there's going to be a pogrom. There's going to be mass slaughter, beatings, and uh, so forth like we've seen before. And God's just like, uh, nah. And he just takes a bucket of water and pours it on the fire and it's out. And everybody goes walking home like, I wonder why that happened. You know, it's like, <laughs> okay, that's the kind of thing that God can do. And uh, it was a menacing situation, very menacing. And God's just like, I don't think so. I'm not going to, we're not ready for this. And he put the, he put the halt on him. At other times he doesn't. You know, it's not like we can automatically say at any time what God is going to do and what he's not going to do. It's up to him. But we should think about this. We should think about this. Because a lot of us have that uh, dream in our heart that we would love to be a part of a great movement of God ourselves right here in our city. We can look back at these instances today and we can see, oh, yeah, well, that was obviously God working there because when I mean, look at the fruit that was born, look at how it just ripped across the map of the ancient world like that. At that time, though, this would not have been as easy to see as it is today. You know, these things would have presented them just like a string of boom, boom, things happening and that cohesive picture where, oh, well, it's just obvious God was basically making things happen for them. That, that would not have been as evident to them. We should remember that. Afterwards, you look back and you start seeing, you know, God has stepped us every step of the way here. He's the one that's brought us so far. And we can see all these points at which he lined things up and made things happen. And we're like, whoa, whoa, yeah. But we see it after the fact. While you're going through it, you don't see that. It just seems like there's all these chaos and menacing things and things going wrong, occasionally things going right. And uh, you have to take a lot of this by faith that God's going to work. So, uh, 